Hey folks, Asher here with Unfeigned Christianity. I have a couple confessions I have to make this week on the podcast. I've been thinking about this and thinking how Unfeigned Christianity, the goal is to, to just be fairly straightforward, fairly open and unscripted. Last week in my podcast... I shared an interview that I had with with um, Dr. John Waldron, and at some point in the interview, he references Fresh Start, and I said I was like, "Oh yeah, I was just in Wayne's County earlier this summer," and it felt kind of odd at the time. He gave me kind of a little unique look, and I was just racking my brain. I was like, "Is that right? Is that?" the right one because like I've honestly not been to Indiana very often in my life. Well, actually I have quite a bit in life, but I usually just drive through. And I've never been to southern Indiana until August. And I'm thinking about this and later I was listening to the recording and I just decided to look it up. Where is Waynes County, Indiana? And it's like nowhere close to where I was. It's nowhere close to fresh start. Um I was thinking of Davies County, Indiana, Montgomery, Indiana area. <laughs> Is that how you say it? Davies County, Davis County, something like that. And I was so embarrassed that I cut it out of the interview because I was like, man, I do not want people to hear that I called it Waynes County, Indiana, when it's actually Davis County, Indiana. And it fit well. Like, I don't know if, if especially if you're listening to the audio, you probably didn't even know that there was a cut um, on the video. You may have seen a little blip or something. But anyway, so I decided to be faithful to my unscriptedness. I will cover my track by, by making that confession. <laughs> I actually do edit quite a bit because there's, there's a lot. I realize I say, um, um, uh, and all kinds of stuff a lot. And so I'll go through and like cut out half of them so that it doesn't sound quite as bad. Um, and and then there's different times where maybe maybe one of my kids runs in or something and have to pause it. I cut that out. Anyways, so I do do some editing, but I try to keep it as raw and, and conversational as possible. The other confession that I have is, did you know that I stock blogs? Do you do that? Do you stock blogs? Um, there's quite a number of bloggers that I kind of keep tabs on and sometimes I don't necessarily keep tabs on them but I'm a part of enough Facebook groups that like bloggers are sharing their stuff on that I'll, I'll notice I'll pay attention to when so and so share something and uh, one of the people that I've stalked I've, I've been aware of for a while and um, just recently caught my attention was is um a lady by the name of Gertrude Slaybaugh. I think she goes by Gert, maybe Gert Slaybaugh. And I'm familiar with her son. I went to Bible school with his, her son, Tim. Otherwise, I didn't really know her. And I saw this article that she did called um, What I Think About White Privilege. I was like, oh, interesting. Um, I knew she's from the South. They live in the South. They live in uh, Virginia, I think it is. And... So I figured she'd, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what she has to say. Um, I did not realize at the time that her husband is pastor of their church. And so I read the article and was, was curious what take she'd have if she'd come out kind of giving a rebuttal to the concept of white privilege. But it was quite the opposite. It was just a, a fairly transparent journey of initially reacting to the concept of white privilege because you know her family and her husband's family grew up poor you know, they weren't privileged they didn't have any privilege what's this concept of white privilege but then discovering as she began dialoguing with other black friends in her community that there is a level even as poor white people there's a level of privilege they've experienced it which is definitely my experience um more to do, not so much with black people specifically, but here in LA and, and Latino people. And, um, then I, I asked her if I could share 
the article and then we got to dialoguing about things they were doing and in i think in i, f I forget if it was in the article um I'm going to link the article and different stuff here in the show notes. You can check it out, but I can't remember right offhand if it's in the article or if it was in our dialogue. She mentioned how her, their church is there's set. They have set aside once or twice a month, a scheduled class or service where they're learning. They're trying to understand the, the issues that people face people of color specifically people specifically in their community down in the south why are racial tensions so heightened right now why are there riots happening um and anyways in the dialogue in our email back and forth she shared some of what they've been doing and i was just so blown away by the fact that a church is intentionally learning they they brought in guest speakers to share about it They've provided a list of resources, um, some of which I took. I took their list and kind of meshed it with with my own resources. And I'm gonna have a, a PDF available for you guys in the show notes, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it in the description. But um, just for for our own training, this I am really excited about this episode because the long story short, I asked her if if her and her husband could come on and if I could just interview them what are you guys doing to learn as a church and what is that like like is it is it an easy experience how do you create safety to have because these are very volatile conversations to have in our churches and yet they're so important to have and i think a lot of my impression would be a lot of people realize we need to have them somehow but maybe Oh, just overwhelmed, like not sure where to start. How do we go about doing it? And then maybe also a little scared because there's going to be a lot of conflict. There, there maybe doesn't have to be conflict, but there's going to be a lot of strong opinions and maybe even emotional opinions about whether it's the language, the, the narrative that we're listening to. And I mean, this issue, racial equality and racial reconciliation has become so politicized too, that even to acknowledge the idea of systemic racism can be considered to be believing a leftist lie or something. And, and I just wanted to hear from a pastor's perspective, what are they doing in their church to have this conversation and to learn and and also not allow the world's narrative and understanding of what racial equality should look like or what justice should look like to guide their conversation but how do we as christians have these conversations with a gospel centered in a way that's redemptive that builds up that adds to racial reconciliation this just to give you a warning is this introduction is quite long um, I have done, I think I've done like two or three episodes now that are right at about an hour because I want to prove to you guys that that's my typical length, right? <laughs> couple, couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we had a two hour, uh, conversation. This one is, I think it's at least about an hour and a half, maybe, maybe not quite. Um, but it's really good. And I, I, I give the whole thing to you guys. Take some time to listen, share it with others, share it with uh, family, uh, a, a group of you. Um, I hope it can be helpful to church leaders, to churches as a way of like, how do we have these conversations in a redemptive way, in an up, upbuilding way? Um, and, and specifically, listen to, pay attention to we as white people, right? If So I was poor, like our, our family was, was not wealthy. I didn't feel like we were privileged even even outside of wealth and and that's definitely gert and and dave's story as well but listen to how they've been willing to i guess humble themselves and and learn um and even like he talks about asking some fellow black uh, pastors in their community to come in and share with them and some of them didn't didn't respond like didn't want to do it and and being willing to let them have that 
decision, right? Instead of getting frustrated or upset at them because if you want racial equality, you should come and share with us, right? And, and just that journey of like letting go of our, our own sense of put togetherness and whatever and just listening to somebody else's story that might make us feel a bit vulnerable or insecure or something. I don't I just think it's really good. I hope you enjoy it. If you, uh, there's different, I, I'm going to link the article, the PDF and different things in the show notes. If you've enjoyed this show, if you find this one um, meaningful and helpful, please feel free to share it and rate and review it. If you have any questions, email me at podcast at asherwhitmer.com. I'd love to hear from you or you can comment if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, and also if, if you want to support the work, you can check that out on Patreon dot com forward slash asher whitmer uh one of the benefits that comes with a patreon membership is we talk through we process um i I wrote an article thinking through the black lives matter movement and and also have a review of the color of compromise book and just different current events current issues um we process that you can check that out on patreon.com forward slash asher whitmer and now for my interview with dave and gert slaybach Very good. All right. We are live here on Unfeigned Christianity. Thank you, Dave and Gert, for coming on the podcast. Welcome. You could talk. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, I read a blog post by Gert uh, a couple weeks ago now, yeah. I think, yeah. um, where she was just sharing about her experience or her perspective on white privilege I, I the title of the article is slipping my mind in the moment but i read it and she talks uh in the article about her uh just coming to awareness of the privilege that she had and the thing that s- stood out to me especially is you talked about how you guys viewed yourselves you you came from poor communities um rural communities and you know we don't have any privilege and and i hear that so often that's definitely my story as well um and then just coming to awareness of there is a level of of privilege that we have and Mm -hmm. leaning into that and growing had some email dialogue back and forth and i just just got hit my mic here discovered that um dave and gert are past the lead a church uh faith mennonite in Southern Virginia. Is that correct? Did I get the name right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and your church is proactively learning and leaning into this conversation as well. And it was, stood out to me because there's, there's a spectrum, obviously, in our conservative Anabaptist circles of, of openness or, or willingness to have this conversation in our churches But one of the things that I am hearing often is just kind of an overwhelm, like, okay, so what do we do or how do we start? What, what are we supposed to do? And then, you know, there's no hidden secret that there's also pushback. And so I think a lot of church leaders are feeling pressured, pressured by current events, like we should do something, but then maybe feeling overwhelmed. And I just thought it would be great to have you guys on and just hear at least one church's story of how how they're going about this and exploring it. So thanks for thanks for joining. Maybe you guys want to introduce yourselves a little more, give some background to your your lives, your church, your setting. Well, we're in a county that is fifty five percent black, so unlike some parts of the country, we do have a a, a large black population here. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> we're in the Bible Belt, so there are churches everywhere. There are six churches, I think, within a mile of ours, okay? Some white, some black. There are plenty of churches around the county, um, black as well as white. But traditionally here, um, other than funerals, eh, Maybe occasionally weddings, there is not much interaction 
uh, on regular services. Um, we do have a couple congregations in the county that uh, that have some black members, and there are some black churches that have some white members, but that is by far the minority. And and our looking at this is not to try to create a multiracial congregation, but we have had blacks attend our church. Uh, we have personally been involved in foster care quite a bit over the last 14 years or so. And we've had uh, quite a few black children who, of course, while they were with us, related to our congregation and were very warmly received. Um, so I think what really brought it to the front was what was happening across the, mm -hmm. the country. It's really kind of highlighted it. But it's it was something we had we've had some discussions about before. But I guess I would like to say from the outset, Asher, that I think one of the challenges that we have as as Christians is to not try to create a theology around this issue in response to what is happening nationally, but rather it needs to be a theology based on what the gospel is according to Jesus Christ. Now we're behind the eight ball on that, mm -hmm. obviously, but as real as our experiences are and our black brothers and sisters have, have some very painful experiences in their past. But I would say this kindly even to them. And for those of us who are wanting to be very sympathetic and are, and are feeling really regretful because of what they have happened. We cannot build our theology based on personal experience. Our theology must be based on the gospel. Mm -hmm. hmm. And according to the Bible, there is one race. Hmm. Very clearly. Mm -hmm. We find that in the Old Testament. We find that Peter, you know, in, in the book of Acts, he says that Jesus Christ has come. He's broken down the wall of partition as made of one race, all peoples. So that has to become the basis. And, and I don't say that so that's something we can hide behind it and say, well, then we don't need to talk about our current things because we do. But overall, I think we have to be careful that we don't. It, it, it gets down to the same thing. We start talking about justice and we say, OK, there's been great injustice done. So we need to do something to to even, you know, to, to turn the tables. That's human justice. We need to be more about godly justice and what it means to reconcile people to Jesus Christ and the, the equality that we find, not only across race, but across gender, across nationality, everything we find in our oneness in Jesus Christ. So I just say that from the outset because I, I think sometimes when I read what some churches are doing and what some individuals um, – who profess to be followers of Christ, much of their response, much of what I read is not Bible. It's their reaction to Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and the George Floyd killing and, and on and on and on. And I'm not saying those aren't legitimate things to talk about, but at the end of the day, our theology and what I wanted for our congregation is to not be a reactionary congregation because to what has happened, but rather to understand what it means, what Jesus Christ is calling us to. And so when we first started these, and maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the first thing we did was we had three black leaders come and speak to our congregation. Initially, we talked about having dialogue, and then we said, no, 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 no. We need to just sit and listen. And one that we chose was a black minister and he took us to the word. And I so appreciated that. Another was a very successful black businessman who had worked for government agency, USDA, and shared the extra hurdles that he was faced with because he was black. And then we had another lady who is a community leader in the area. So that was the way that we started this. Um, and, you know, it, in some respects, we're in a unique situation, but I, I, when you boil it down, I'm not sure 
it's that unique because as white people, and one of the things we've had to talk about was white privilege. And, and you're right. When you come from a poor background, you weren't born with a silver spoon. We think well, we don't have it. We have privilege. But I'm not sure who came up with the definition, but it's been shared in our congregation. And, and it is so true. If for those of us who are white in America, now in other parts of the world it could be different, but in America, we have never, or it's, or it's almost without exception, we've never faced a challenge in life that was greater because of the color of our skin. That is white privilege. It's not about money, but we've never had a hurdle thrown at us in, in any endeavor that it was greater because we were white than we were something else. And so as a congregation, it's been something for us to look at. We, we've not had issues with other races here, but it's pretty much been, we let you alone, you let us alone, you know, that type of thing. And, and we're wanting to create something better. It was really good for us the first night when we had those three speakers. We, our ministers told us, you know, we need to come to this tonight and we need to listen to listen and not to think of what we're going to say back. We're going to sit here and listen and we're not going to say anything back. And, you know, there's so many things going through your mind when they're saying things. And we did that. We sat and listened to their stories. And it was it was really enlightening and humbling to do that. Yeah, no, that, that's really good. I uh, need to be a little careful because I've got some noise going on in the back here. Oh. <laughs> I'll have to maybe go back and edit that out. But um, I, I really appreciate your distinction of one that we are all one race. The I think I didn't live through the civil rights movement. Obviously, I'm curious. How old are you guys? Is that something that you remember at all? Well, I remember I was born in Ohio. Okay. We did not have any blacks where I lived. We, My family moved to Virginia when I was seven. And so when we arrived in Virginia, schools here were segregated. I came in the middle of my second grade. And I think it was fifth grade, three years later, when schools integration was mandated. And so all of a sudden our schools were integrated, teachers were integrated. And as I look, so I experienced that. We had some Ku Klux Klan activity in the area. I remember the newspapers reporting having pictures of crosses being burned in some yards. But by and large at school was a fifth grader, sixth, seventh, eighth, coming up through. Um, it didn't make a, it didn't integrate. We came to the same school, but, but like in the lunchrooms and so forth, you know, it took, I say I was probably middle school or high school before you really started seeing a lot of interaction. Um, but there wasn't conflict. The conflict of this community was the parents and the teachers and the teachers. It wasn't the kids. That's where the conflict lay, conflict lay, and no, and maybe that's said. normal. You, I know, my fifth grade teacher, when my brother was was two grades ahead of me, and so two years earlier, when integration was on the horizon, was being talked about, looked like it was going to happen. This was late sixties. He came home one day from school and said, told my mother, he said, my teacher said, and she a white, of course that if the black children come to our school, we just won't play with them. Now, two years later, her faculty was half black. <laughs> so yeah, and the rest of her teaching career until she retired some years later, she, she taught with black colleagues. But that was, that was somewhat entrenched uh, in, in, in our community, so. I grew up in Western Maryland and there were no black students in my schools either, but we, we had fresh air children from New York city in our home every summer and 99% of them were not white and we didn't want white kids. We wanted other kids cause it was more interesting. So I never had that much interaction with black people on a personal level until I moved here. And then I started 
I worked with some. And we also had, we had kids who we took to church on Wednesday nights and neighbor kids who came down here and played. So, yeah. And Dave yeah. was actually called yeah. a nigger lover. In, oh, yeah. He played with elementary black school. children. And yeah. so other kids called him yeah. nigger, lover. nigger lover. So he yeah. had some of that. I never experienced any of that. Interesting. Yeah. When did you, maybe you said, and I missed it, but when did you move to Southern Virginia? 1965. Okay. So, we're in our 60s. It was 1965 when you moved. Yeah, 1965 was when I moved, yeah. moved to Virginia. Yeah. So that was right. Integra integration was manned. I think it was 1968, maybe. It was right about there is when our schools had to integrate. So all across our county, every community had a white school and a black school. Same community. Sometimes they were with on the same campus. I mean, on property that was all owned by the school system. So we didn't have a separate school division, but there were black schools and there were white schools. And so when integration happened, then what they did was they, they split grades. Certain grades went to the what had formerly been a black school. Certain grades went to what, elementary, the white school. And then the high school, uh, one high school became a senior high for all students and the other high school became the middle school for wow. all students in the community. Wow. Yeah. So That's all the facilities were still used, but if, when, when the integration happened, not only did pupils integrate, but they also integrated faculty and administration. Mm -hmm. So principals and teachers and all that happened. One fell swoop. We left school in June, first of June, one year, and three months later, when we went back to school, we were integrated. Everybody was totally. So how did how did that go? Was it was it pretty tumultuous? How how the teacher that it, it really I don't know how it was at the adult level because I mean I was I was fifth grade, but I don't remember there weren't major episodes on schools or mm you know, on the buses and that type of thing among the students. But you, we sure heard it from the, our parents, you know, the adults in the community. Interesting. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was a major, it was a major deal, but there weren't riots and, you know, that type of thing here. Yeah. And so I like, that's something that I've pondered a little bit about this year's and, and the current events, even stemming back into 2016 and so forth is it seems to me like back then obviously i'm just studying history and some people who remember it but i don't remember it um there was martin luther king jr and a few prominent kind of nationally recognized christian leaders in the civil rights movement there was the Black Panthers and other, I think there were a couple other more radical um, right. black movements. Whereas the Christian movements now seem to be a lot more, they're not as centralized or as nationally recognized, maybe a little more localized. And the big movement is Black Lives Matter. And so it seems that for Christians to look at it, if you, if you're not in a community where, where you have blacks around or any kind of multi-ethnicity experience, all you know about it is through the news. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. You don't have firsthand experience. Yeah. Do, do you see a similar dynamic? Do you think that's part of why it's dif more difficult for, some of our people, some of our churches to lean into the conversation. It seems like we're just giving into these liberal um, black, black lives matter organization types thing. Or was there similar dynamics back then in the sixties? Um, I'm just, just kind of dovetailing on your, your right. emphasis of a, a good the theological base. Mm -hmm. Um it's well, to start like, with, it's yeah. scary. It's scary to to reach out and learn and find out that maybe you've been wrong 
in some things you thought. Mm. Who yeah. wants to admit that? Who wants to admit that they've had white privilege when they've never thought they did? So. Well, you know, it, it's it's interesting because I spent my teen years then growing up in this community and even am, among the white community, um, I definitely grew up hearing that blacks were okay in their place. Mm-hmm. But in other words, there was a separate place for black. Now, we didn't have, I never, in this area, I know it was before my time, before I got here, but when I moved here in 1965, we didn't have, I mean, there might have been some places that were kind of understood that, well, that's, blacks are more welcome in that restaurant than the other, but there were nothing, no signs, you know, white drinking fountain, color drinking fountain, that type of thing. Not, that was all earlier. But it, it, it was interesting, even among Christian people that I knew personally that had black employees, they still were treated differently. And their explanation was that that's what the blacks wanted, that they were more comfortable there. In other words, you would not have them you would not have them to your house for a meal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or if you had employees, uh, the blacks would eat like at a meal time, they would eat, tend to eat by themselves, not as part of the group. And and it was what was said was, well, that that's the way they wanted it. But when you really boil that down and talk and you hear from the black perspective, they wanted that way because they, they didn't feel welcome. You understand Mm -hmm. what I'm getting at? So, but I think there's a big difference between Martin Luther King. And I remember, I remember Mm -hmm. when he was unfortunately assassinated. I remember I was old enough to understand what he was doing with the marches and so forth. But Asher, his emphasis was totally different than Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. It was about some of the same issues, but what made him different was he always promoted Mm nonviolence. Martin Luther Mm -hmm. King's marches did not torch businesses, you know, did not take over and assault police officers. And I mean, his, he, all his, even when they were mistreated, he, he admonished them that you, you did not retaliate. So, I think today, when we see the movements that are happening, it is it is a challenge for Christian leaders. The way organizations that are on the forefront now, like Black Lives Matter, their emphasis and the means that they are taking is so abhorrent to everything that we believe about how we submit to the laws of the land that we could throw the baby out with the wash water very easily. Mm. You couldn't do that with Martin Luther King, but you certainly can do it now. And so I think that's the way. And so when I talk with blacks, this is what I hear. Well, okay. Martin Luther King tried. And what did you all do? You killed him. Hmm. So the pressure, you know, this is just continues to build up. And the reason things are happening now is because Martin Luther King's way didn't work. Now, if Martin Luther King could speak today, he would say it did work. A lot of the changes that happened in our legal system that came out of that under President Johnson's administration happened in response to Martin Luther King's work. But it's interesting, and I think this is something we have to be challenged with, is that America, I, I, I would I would take the venture to say this. America has never made changes legally in the status of blacks in this country. Ultimately, I mean, because it was the right thing to do. Now, when it actually happened and when bills were signed, leaders said that. But we were forced as white people, we were forced to do it. 
Hmm. And so even though we brought some equality, the blacks know it wasn't like we woke up one day and said, the Lord told me this is wrong. No. No. Political yeah. pressure yeah. became so great. That's what made it happen. And people don't get over that overnight. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. like if you have a conflict with someone and finally they say, OK, you know, we got to work together. You've got we're working for the same poor. We're going to be in the same office so that. So, uh, OK, let, let's just let bygones be gone gone. So we're going to get along. That does bring reconciliation. You're saying, yeah, it's only because you have to be in this office with me. You know, it's it's a little bit of that type of thing. And somehow that is so, especially for those of us who have lived in areas where there are blacks. We've got to reexamine that in our heart and we've got to reach out to people because it is the godly thing. Hmm. It's what Jesus Christ calls us to do, not because the laws of the land say I cannot discriminate. Hmm. I got, I've got to be willing to rent or hire or whatever a black person because it's what Jesus would have me do, not because if I don't, I might get taken to court. Mm-hmm. And that to mm-hmm. me is the difference in our our approach has to be as believers in Christ versus what the general population is doing. Yeah. yeah. The one thing the, that I put in that blog post was I one of the girls that I worked with back and she came to our house one afternoon. We sat on the deck and talked for two hours and you talked about George Floyd and things like that. And she said, she said, trying to do it peacefully and coming to the table hasn't worked. And that's why they're rattling the cages. She wasn't mm-hmm. saying it's right. That it's right. But she was saying they're that's rattling the doing. cages because nobody would listen before. And there was a lot of pain there mm-hmm. when she said that to me. Yeah. People have mm-hmm. not, they might have listened to the words you said, but they haven't heard. Yeah. But what the black community has to hear from the church, from the true church of Jesus Christ is that we love you and accept you because it's what Jesus calls us to do, not because it's the law of the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've we've got to get off of that wagon. And we should want to do it because Jesus wants, you know, because we want to. We We should. Yeah. And that's, and that's why like some people might look at, you know, we ended racism back in 1865, like the civil war, Mm-hmm. ended it right but it didn't really because it was you know there again it was forced it was mm-hmm. coerced there's no more slavery but the the mindset the attitudes the the behaviors just continue on throughout history mm-hmm. um, yeah i think a real challenge for a lot of churches too is the whole idea of interracial marriage hmm. and of course now that's the law of the land it, you know up until i forget the exact year but sick in the 60s mm-hmm. It was illegal. It was illegal in America. Interracial marriage was illegal. And that has been changed. But I'm not sure, even though it's legal, how many churches are really open and supportive (laughs) for that? I... Now you're yeah, crossing. I, now you're crossing the border. <laughs> I I didn't realize. I mean, I didn't know how much of a controversial issue it was till there was oh one conversation on Facebook in the last couple of months where there were there were people suggesting that like just just like bluebirds and mm-hmm. and brown birds don't mate together. Yeah. Then yeah, and yeah. and it astounds me. Yeah, I um, heard one black minister. One black minister said to white fathers, he thinks this is the litmus test. Are you okay with a black man marrying your white daughter? Yeah. He said yeah, that's that. for him yeah. as a black man, he said that's the litmus, litmus test. That was one individual speaking. But I think if you look across our Anabaptist circles, that would be a tough test for many, many mm-hmm. of the fathers in our congregations, including ministers. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, the impression that I get of your church, you said early on that 
the goal wasn't so much to create a multi-ethnic church, which, which is interest. Um, <laughs> wasn't really on my. Well, we're not to talk opposed about, but, to that, but yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, I know. I've I've uh I've been hearing more conversation just in in broader, even outside of Anabaptist church, but just the like there used to be a movement to really become Mm multi-ethnic in your Mm -hmm. church but then that still doesn't necessarily solve the issue you because Mm -hmm. you get your token people of color but rather just teach as as a body how we think about other peoples and other ethnicities Mm -hmm. which is what you guys right as pastor in our congregation i am more concerned about how we as a congregation relate to the blacks in our community the other six days of the week than I'm on Sunday. Mm. If, if we learn to relate in a God honoring way, the other six days, blacks will feel welcome at our church on Sunday. Yeah. If they choose to come. But one of the things that I think we have to recognize is that the answer to, to racism is not to put two races in a blender and blend them up so you don't see two races anymore. And so, you know, the statement's been made, and we've heard it. It's come out in these meetings, too, and that we've been having. You know, the most integrated hour in America is is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. I, I don't know. I, I know that's a very integrated hour. I mean, unintegrated, very segregated yeah. hour is, is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. But at the same time, I have visited quite a few black churches in our com- in our community. Their style of worship, especially music, is not my style. And I try to think for those who have grown up with that and that is their culture, why would they want to come to our culture? To come to our <laughs> culture. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I find it interesting when, and I've seen it on both sides, I've seen it with black pastors and I've seen it with white pastors say, oh, we're, our ambition is, our goal is to, to have a, a, a mixed, you know, culture church. And I'll say, okay, first thing I want to ask you is, what are you going to do about your music? Mm. Because inevitably, I have yet to find a church that says, oh, well, we have a mixture of music. No, they don't. Yeah. They choose one or the other, and you, and you go with it. And so what you're saying was, well, come to our church and, and just, you know, adopt our style of worship. And there's not, we know there's not one style of worship. So I don't think I'm, my goal for our congregation is to grow in our understanding of what it means to relate as Jesus would have us to Monday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. Not, we're not focusing on Sunday. Now I want anybody that comes to our church to be as welcome, regardless of their skin color or their, ethnicity or economic standing or whatever, obviously. And most pastors would say that. But I think if we can accomplish a right attitude and practice in how we relate six days of the week, we won't have to worry about Sunday. And I think if we focus on Sunday, but we're not focused on how we are in our homes, in the workplace, in school, in our community, you can do all you want to on Sunday and it's not going to fly. Mm-hmm. The one thing that the black minister told us that night, he was he the one or was Martha Reynolds? Um, you know, we should stop saying I don't see color because we are. We should not be saying I'm colorblind because we're not colorblind. We are different colors. And he said we shouldn't be colorblind. Right. He was saying, <laughs> don't don't say I don't see color because you do see color. I see color. Mm-hmm. That was I liked mm-hmm. that. Yeah. That's he said, "Acknowledge the value of the other color, the other culture." Yeah. yeah. Don't say, "Well, I don't see color," because you do. Yeah. yeah, and and the Bible talks about tribes, tongues, and languages. Yes. You know? So there's there's these distinctions. So when we look at the Book of Revelation, the throne. Yeah. that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So so we're gonna see. We're gonna. I'm convinced we're gonna see color in heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So um, how did this, how did this, you've alluded to it a few times, but how did the intentional 
learning as a church body start? Did, did that start just here in 2020 with George Floyd or Am- Ahmaud Arbery or was Actually, it years? Our, our Sunday evening program committee, I happened to be on it this year. And um, we talked about it when things were happening with George Floyd, that we as a congregation need to do something. We need to become educated and we need to become proactive and we need to find what God wants us to do in this community. So we we came up with the idea to get these speakers in and they were all people that one or more of us knew. Some of them, mm-hmm. some of our congregation didn't know any of them, but all of us on the committee knew one of them. And so because of personal contact, we, we contacted them and asked them to come. And when we were done that night, we said... <laughs> we've just gotten started. We got to do more. And so the next meeting, we, um, we had two other guys, well, Tim is one of them and another guy in our church who we asked them to, to lead this. And then the next night when we got together, the first thing Which we was did was weeks later. yeah, a couple yeah. weeks later, we talked about what we learned that night at the panel. What did the speaker say to us? What did we agree with? What did we have questions about? We talked about those things. And then we also, they asked us to give them words that we didn't understand or we weren't explained like Mm -hmm. uh, redlining, profiling, white privilege, racial reconciliation, gerrymandering. And so they gave us all those definitions. So we understood what we were talking about when these things have happened, even in our community. And, and they also took us to the word again about the responsibility that we have. So we're not done. We've had four meetings. Um, the one meeting we had a couple of people who shared personal experiences they had with, with um, like one example was when when a guy was profiled because he was black riding in a car with some other white girls. And um, so that was shared. And the next one is probably going to be more, where do we go from here? What are we going to do with what we've now learned? Um, but we've, um, one of our committee came up with a list of things. I shared that with you, Asher. Uh, mm-hmm. Reading material, podcast videos. We've had those at the church. A lot of people have looked at the videos. I don't know who's listening to the different podcasts, but mm. you know it's out there for people to look at. I've read some of the books. I know some other people have, and we've really been encouraged to reach out to people who are black and to become their friends, so we can learn what it's like to be black. One couple, mm-hmm. one family had. Um, had some uh, workers from the, the dry cleaning that they used came, came into their home for a meal and um, just encouraged to, to notice black people and to reach out to them. And, and, you know, we can't say we don't have white privilege until we've talked to a black person and found out from them, do we have white privilege, you know? And it's been a little, <coughs> we haven't, been able to do some of the things we would like to have done because of COVID. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just not a time to, not everybody's comfortable. Not everybody's trying to having people in your home and this type of thing. Um, But we are, we are encouraging it. And then some churches, a lot of churches have altered their services such that it's difficult. Right now is a difficult time to to interact. Even, even funerals and certainly weddings and so forth. There's just not the opportunity that there, that there had been when we started this, that it looked like it was, you know, it was going to be. You know, I was, I was in town one day, stopped in, I was having lunch with a friend at a, um, at a small cafe and one of my former coworkers came in and it was the week that everything was happening with George Floyd and she's black and she's a believer we hadn't seen each other in years and, you know, we hugged with our masks on and I just felt prompted that day to pay for her lunch. And I thought, Oh, this is dumb. You know, she's working. She has more money than I do. You know, and it's just like, it wouldn't leave me. So I, I said, I said, I want to pay for your lunch. And she said, Oh no, you know, we argued about it. And I said, no, I'm paying for it. She had tears in her eyes and I think it was just because of all the stuff that was going on, even in the county, the, the unrest. And then I just said, let me buy your lunch. It was my way of loving on her. And there are things like that that we can do 
if, if we're willing to, to reach out to people and we can, we can make a difference. I mean, I might not be able to change the world, but I can change one person and, and I think and they can change one person. And, and, and with the thing, even though, I mean, we had a rally in our, t- our small town here. Um, it, it was, it was peaceful, but it was a, a rally in response to the George Floyd killing. Um, and, and there were a few events like that. And I just challenged our congregation. I said, you know, every, as, as whites, we, we feel the tension. I can't imagine what a person of color feels right now. And I said, right now, in these next days and weeks and months, my encouragement is go out of your way. Mm-hmm. When you're walking into a store, if you happen to see if there's any black that's close to your proximity, stand and hold the door and, and let them go first. Do some intentional thing. I'm a contractor. If you're at Lowe's and we have some other guys in our in our church work in construction, you know, normally we as, as contract, we run in, we get our materials, you go out, you know, you can someone from Lowe's help you load, but usually we don't have time to wait for them. So we're loading our stuff ourselves and so forth. I said, and sometimes we'll help one another, especially someone you know. But I said, you see a black contractor, you see a black homeowner trying to load something, go help them. Mm-hmm. Go offer to him. Do things like that. You're at the grocery store. Just right now, intentionally, not that you don't know what wouldn't do for a white person, but intentionally, because the blacks in particular are so sensitive to this right now. Mm-hmm. Go out of mm-hmm. our way to show the love of Christ. And yeah. I think yeah. all of us just, I mean, it's a good habit to get into for or in, body of any color, but certainly black. Yeah. But we are so used in our community with the blacks in general take second seat. Mm. You know, people are walking in somewhere the blacks are not going to go first. They're going to leave because they've been pushed back before. You know, mm. now you'll get some young <laughs> whippersnappers. You know, they'll try to make a point of it. But the older, especially my generation, they're not going to. I mean, you have to hold the door and encourage them to. You know, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're just so used to being second or third, certainly Latin. That and I said, we need it. We need to, for our personal growth and development, as well mm-hmm. as to show the love of Christ, that we need to start being intentional. Mm-hmm. And I said, little things like that grow to be big things. Yeah. So. Yeah, that is so good. Because, it's I mean, it's not about white guilt or like somehow we have to feel guilty for but just retraining ourselves to Mm -hmm. be inclusive acknowledging that hey you're here you exist Mm -hmm. i can help yeah that's good Mm -hmm. what are um has there been pushback in your church as you have these conversations are there if if you if someone hears the phrase systemic racism or is, does that bring up any heat or we have some passive aggressive oh yeah people <laughs> we have some people that are that are uh sitting on the sidelines watching uh have they they they're they've not not come to these meetings but not actively engaged um and i would say they're my generation they're not the young oh, okay. people, okay? Hmm. Um, I think our young people are, are all engaged. Mm-hmm. Very, it's, much, it's very much so. Very much so. They, they are leading the way. So, But there are some of my generation that, for instance, you start talking about profiling, you know, they'd be very quick to say, well, I mean, look at the statistics. Look, look at the statistics. I mean, why would, a, why would mm-hmm. the police not? Because look at, you know, I mean, they should expect that. And if that's the way, and my response to that was, but statistics are for a large, it's not for individuals, hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, but we want to hide behind some things like that. And we say, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, um, you probably have you encountered, you probably have the, um, why can't I call his name right now? Um, the fellow that's doing the uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Have you, Encountering if he is, he's been posting them on. Um, 
what's his name? He's a he's a football player. He was a professional football player. I can't call his name right Benjamin now. Benjamin Watson? No. No. Who was it, Rebecca? Do you remember? Well, anyway, um, but one of the things he said is he gave an example. He said when he was a child, he had not encountered a dog before, never had a dog as a pet. And he had a bad experience with a dog, scared him. I don't know if he was actually harmed, but literally scared him so much. So now when he sees a dog, he he instantly feels that because he doesn't know if that dog is mean or not. And he said, mm-hmm. for a lot of you whites, that's the way you view a black man. You, you hear these statistics, you see this. So when a black man, you're on an elevator, and a black man steps in, it's just you and him. Instantly, you you know, you're feeling for your wallet. You're feeling what, because you don't know if he's safe or not safe. He's kind of like me with the dog. He's, I don't know if, I don't know how to react to this dog because my experience with that dog was bad. And so that has colored everything for me. That was his example. And so I don't know for those in our congregation, I don't know firsthand as I know them and I've known them for now several decades. I don't know of any bad experience that they had, but I know we all are affected by the media and social media, Mm -hmm. you know, with what we hear. Um, yeah. A lot of them have been influenced by their parents who are oh, sure. no longer living. Sure, but sure. Yeah. Well, I was, different. yeah, I, I was intrigued a little bit because you, you said in your generation, like back in the 60s, 68, mm-hmm. when integration happened, it was more at the parental level. That's right. And so That's where the conflict your, was. your peers would have been okay with or grown up in integration or had this happening yes but it, but my generation it was kind of like our parents generation was the blacks shouldn't even be here not in our schools okay yeah my generation became okay but you have your place oh i see you know, yeah i mean in my generation for instance any interracial dating was very taboo yeah. I mean, people yeah. could be assaulted for that. Okay. Yeah. But in my parents' generation, generation before, uh, the blacks can have equal education, but they need to be in their own school. Yeah. You see, you see the progression where it's yeah. it takes yeah. kind of steps for it. Yeah. yeah. And now yeah. my kids' generation, most of them don't ha- are much more open to interracial marriage, even. Mm hmm. You know, the next generation. My generation, uh, not so much. Well, we had, yeah. our kids were in public school, and we had a lot of black kids who would come oh, and play did. at our house. Yeah. I had a mother mm-hmm. who dropped a boy off one day. I didn't even, she didn't ask me. I don't know who was coming. My son just told him to come and play. And they, our kids are used to it. That generation is used to it. Yeah. But when you'd probably didn't oh, no, have, no, no. he wouldn't have had no. black kids, and a white kid wouldn't have gone to play at a black kid's house yeah. either. But now, I remember that time our oldest son Ben would see, I don't know, fifth or sixth, fifth or sixth grade, and one of his friends from school invited him to the birthday party. And when we went and picked him up, we found he was the only white kid there. I mean, when we dropped him off, yeah. I didn't realize it, and he and was fine. He was he fine. Hadn't, with he it. hadn't thought about it. He, he didn't really think yeah. about it, but <laughs> we noticed it. <laughs> yeah, was the white kid there? Oh yeah, but I mean, this guy was his friend, and yeah. he, you know, he didn't really yeah. think about it. He was the only. Yeah. Now, see, I would have at his age, I would have really noticed that. You know, mm-hmm. I would have gone, but I would have really noticed that. It wasn't that big a thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's interesting. Or uh, that makes me think of my boys who are seven and six now. My two oldest, um, we we moved over to Thailand. <clears throat> excuse me, to Thailand when our oldest was one years old, mm-hmm. and so they spent three years there, and then we moved back mm-hmm. here to L.A. And it even as whites in Northeast L.A. were were fairly decent minority. Um, primarily Latino mm-hmm. and the the one park where we used to live there would be if you'd go on in the middle of the week 
if you go over lunch on the park, there a bunch of uh, you know millennial couples would come out with their their white kids, and my boys would just stand and stare at them. They're white, <laughs> but they yeah. they weren't used to other yeah, white kids. Sure. They were used yeah. to yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's um, interesting. Our county, our county had a, had a fair, what still does. But back in the day, mm-hmm. um, they had a white night and a black night. And on the one mm-hmm. night, the white families came, and on the other night, the black families came. And and that that had a historical precedent, but that has continued. It, it's not it's exclusive. Not a rule. It's, it's not, a, not rule. a rule, but it's mm-hmm. just understood. That a certain night, the majority, I mean, every night there'll be both both races there. But the one night is predominantly white and the one night is predominantly black. That's carryover from my generation Mm -hmm. way, way back. And it's still, there there are still, yes, it still is. There are some vestiges like that that we still, you still see some evidence but I mean, mm. nobody would fuss if, oh, like, no. if a white family came on a black night. Oh, and they do. Nobody Some would do. say anything. But it's just it's the way they've always done it. And it's still talked mm. about. I mean, people know certain night. Oh, you're going that. Well, that's you know, that's that's black night yeah. or that's white night. You know, uh, so it's not um, exclusive, mm-hmm. and it's not the the producer of the fair. I mean, it's not their intention, but it just it just is. It just still mm. is a vestige of something. From the past, that is still it's ingrained. Mm. It's ingrained. It's still there. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious just to go back to the 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 pushback a little bit. Um, how how do you handle that? Does it flare up in the meetings at all, or how do you create safety in a in a meeting like that, or in a congregation in general that you can talk about these things? We're, Without, we're yeah. probably about our next meeting is probably going to bring some of that out because some things were said at the last meeting that, um, yeah, that, that yeah. showed a little bit of some. One of, one of the things that I think is so important whenever we're discussing any issue is we have to recognize and acknowledge that every individual has their perspective and their perspective is real to them. Mm-hmm. It's real to them. Yes. It's hundred percent real to them. Now it may not be correct at all, but you don't change a person's wrong perspective by not acknowledging and allowing them to express their perspective. Mm-hmm. And so I think the challenge when you're leading a meeting like that, or you're in a meeting where you really want to see, for instance, I've not led those meetings. We've had some others, which I've felt very good at as pastor, some late in the congregation leading that. But obviously I have some interest in where we go as a congregation for this. And so the challenge for someone who's leading or is, or is, or is a pastor is to create a safe environment where people can express their perspective and that perspective not be immediately attacked. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there, there's time then without addressing, all right, what Bob said, let's talk about that. See, then what we've done, we put the onus on Bob. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do that because what you do, everyone watches that and sees that. And then they soon figure out what the leaders are looking for. And if I, if I don't feel I've got something to share that supports leaders, I'm going to sit here and keep my mouth shut. And so then you've defeated the purpose of trying to move the whole group forward. So creating a safe, try to create a safe environment where people will share their experience. But yet at the same time, whether it's at that meeting or in a subsequent meeting, we I think as leaders, we have to bring God's word to bear to give us light and direction where we need to move forward. Mm. But it, it's a you can't grow in this without honestly facing your perspective, whether you verbalize it out in front of people or not. It's not something someone's going to type up and put in your little box at church and you're going to take and say, oh, this new way I'm going to start being. It's not going to happen. Not my generation. It's 
decades, you know, I mean, I'm in my 60s now. You're not going to you're not going to issue some mandate down and that's going to change things. It's going to change because of the work of the Holy Spirit in someone's life. And to have you be open to that, it's hearing people's perspective and then being willing and and being intentional about looking to the gospel Hmm. for direction. Rather than because what often happens is if I go after someone's perspective, they say, well, you know, for instance, I'm going to say the profile thing. Well, look at the statistics. So and so, you know, maybe the police had a right to at least initially do what they did. No, 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 no. What we end up doing then is we start reacting to what's happening in the media. We start reacting to right or wrong, whether the police did this right, whether the police did that right. And I'm not saying those things don't come up in our media. Sometimes they do. But ultimately, we are not trying as a church, trying to bring justice and morality in our country, mm-hmm. except to mm-hmm. the work of the grace of God. And that's mm-hmm. different than what the media is doing. And so we're going to be out of step. We have some of the same concerns, but we're out of step and saying, well, justice demands that those law enforcement and, you know, they have to be prosecuted. Well, we are not of our king. We are not of this kingdom. And while our judicial system may require that, that's not the bandwagon that I want to get on and our church to get on. I want our church mm-hmm. on bandwagon. Mm-hmm. What is Jesus Christ say mm-hmm. about how we should view mm-hmm. every other person who he died for? And that is such a challenge. It's hard enough challenge to do when it isn't the hot spot in the media. Yeah. When it's the hot thing in the media, it is so hard because people yeah. want to say, well, what's the thing about Black Lives Matter? I think all lives matter. You, know, you start chasing that money trail. That's yeah. not the issue. You know? yeah. And I think a lot of what I've read, churches that have tried to address this, They've and I understand how easy it can happen, but they get sucked into that hole of responding, for instance, to Black Lives Matter, respond to this, that, the injustice, and this isn't right. Let's look at what Jesus says is right. And what Not, he wants and us, what he wants us to, to do, do rather than saying, Well, there it we, you know, don't we have an amendment? Don't we have a law that says so and so? Well, I mean, I'm not saying there's no value in those discussions. But that is not how we're going to usher in the kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah. By championing the, the the Bill of Rights, for instance, and mm. and the various amendments have been given. Um, mm. But again, I think our black brothers and sisters, if you hear them out, they tend to say, "Yeah, a lot of what the church has done has not been because the church has chosen to do that, but they've been forced to." Yeah. You know, yeah. and when you're forced to do something and someone's in a relationship with you because they're forced to, <laughs> we all know how well that guy that just, you know, yeah. say, well, yeah. yeah, you can't, you know, you, 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 but if, if you really knew your heart, you probably would rather I not be here or you would really yeah. rather I not have this part or you would really rather I not. And that's not going to change overnight. We yeah. don't have members in our congregation who would be opposed to somebody of color joining. They, I don't think so. They might not feel as comfortable relating to them, but there would be nobody in our congregation yeah. that would oppose it. I don't think we would have a problem with that. No. As far so. as feeling like uh, they need to kind of be in their place or I would not want to buy property next to a black family there's some, maybe some of that there, but as mm. far as saying mm. I won't be part of this church if they come, I don't think we have that at all. I don't think we do. Yeah. I, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think we do. But I think we would have we we would have some families that if they were looking to like move their family to a different thing, I think they would be they would be very reluctant to move in among some black families. Yeah. Yeah. There would be some of that in my generation. Some, some of that. I'm yeah, not, not a lot, not but I think there would be some. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, we're. I, 
again, we said, you know, the pushback we had has been kind of passive, but I, you know, I think these next couple meetings, we have our next one, the first of November. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. First of November is first Sunday evening. That's our next one. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting, but I'm hoping that we're taking this fast enough that we're not lally lagging, you know, about mm-hmm. at the same time, giving people time to process and the Holy spirit time to speak to people. Mm-hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. if we took these things back to back to back to back Sunday nights, we would just build more opposition. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have some. And then this last Sunday evening, kind of a little bit of a spinoff on that. Our congregation was encouraged. uh, We called it a a community interaction night to do something Mm -hmm. related to people outside of your comfort zone. Uh, We don't have church. We have church probably our church activity three out of four Sunday nights a month. Sometimes we will have just a free evening, but this was to be a deliberate something out of your comfort zone. So, uh, you know, don't have your friends over, you know, if you're going to interact with a family or individual, that'd be someone you don't normally interact with. If you want to go visit another church or don't go to one where that you often go to go to something totally different. Uh, I did some checking around and I was pretty sure of this from my experience already even separate from the COVID virus. Uh, I don't know of any black congregations in our county that have a Sunday evening service unless mm-hmm. they're having, <laughs> unless they have special, yeah. a special service. You know what I'm saying? Not mm-hmm. a routine. Um, but I have been to various special services, but sometimes I'm the only white person there. Um mm-hmm. I remember I'll just share this little incident one day, and I didn't think about it. I didn't think about it till I was actually sitting in the congregation. But you remember the shooting that happened in Charleston where mm-hmm. the, uh, I forget his name now. The Rural, church, the church. Yeah. The guy that went to the Bible study, the white fella. And at the end of the Bible study, you know, he killed yeah. what, nine parishioners, including the pastor. Well, a couple of weeks after that, I went to an evening service of a black church here and I was the only white person. And I mm. thought that evening, and that's I've done that before, but I thought that evening people seemed just a little different toward me. And it wasn't until about halfway through that service it dawned on me. About I show. think I know why. Mm. I mean, that was so fresh in everybody's mind, yeah. what had happened. And now you go to your church, you think, well, that can never happen in my church. Now I was saying, because this is a church that I had never attended before. Now, I knew a few people there. But most of the people there would not have known me. And so what's this white dude come, come to visit our out. church? Yeah. Is this, is this a, you know, I mean, I just could yeah. sense a little. And I didn't see, I didn't even think about it in going, or maybe I wouldn't even have gone that night. But, um, yeah, it's um, yeah. not feet, yeah. not not kickback or resistance in terms of people saying, we need to stop doing this. We've not had that type of thing. Uh, anyone mm-hmm. express express that so and you know when yeah. you had something ingrained in you when you grew up as a child hearing your parents talk and kind of putting black people down like keeping them in their place it and you're in your 60s and 70s and now you're trying to train yourself into a new way of thinking it doesn't happen overnight you know it, it yeah. takes a while so. mm. yeah yeah well, maybe just to kind of tie a, wrap this up a little bit, what are some things as you, I mean, we, we've heard a lot of, this has been very helpful, just thinking um, you've given different insights of how to orchestrate a, a, a meeting like this or, or um, different ways of doing it, inviting speakers in that, you know, uh, providing resources for uh, your congregation. What, what's some overall advice that you would give if there's, if there's a church out there, um, particularly church leaders who are maybe, well, I guess there's two kinds we could talk about. There's, there's ones that may not feel it's necessary, Mm -hmm. um, a needed conversation, maybe, maybe feel it's all being, uh, politicized, all overhyped yeah. by the politics. 
Um, what's something you'd say to them? Maybe we'll start there and then do the next group. I think the first thing we did and what I would say to a pastor, especially if, 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 a, if a pastor would have that conversation with me, if he had in particular, if he lives in an area that has people of other race, whether it's black or Latino or Hispanic or whatever, have a listening session. Hmm. Now, you may find some reluctance in people to come. Well, we had that. We actually, we had that a bit. We asked a deputy, a black deputy, to come, and I did not know him personally. He's actually a cousin of a girl who came to my house that I had worked with, but he worked with another, a white deputy that I knew, and I asked him for the name of a black deputy. So he knew he had been referred to me. And he's told me he would think about it. And when he got back to me, he was scared to come because he was afraid there'd be violence in our church. No, really. I told him there wouldn't be. Well, he said because of the tension in the county. The tension in the county. And he said, and I have small children. And he said, I don't want to put myself in that. And I was very disappointed. We, yeah. we got another speaker then. But, you know, the fact that he grew up here all his life. And he was scared to come to our little church. And I told him, I said, you know, gave him the name of the deputy who gave me his name. I said, talk to him. And he, Because he was at our church the year before talking about what we can do as a, as a church in our community. I said, he's been there. He knows what we're like. And he can tell you. Yeah. And he, you know, he said, our church is just now starting to meet again because they had closed because of COVID. He said, and I have small children and I just don't want to put myself in there. So it, it really works if you have a relationship with somebody, yeah. because I think if he knew me personally, he might have come. The other people, we knew them. Somebody on our committee knew these people personally. And so it was much easier for them to come to our But church. the one individual that I talked with, um, the one successful black businessman that came, initially, he, he kind of brushed me off. Oh, I think it's a good thing you're doing, but... You know, I just don't know that I've, I've got time or I'm interested in it. And I think the more I talked with him, I probably talked to him 20, 30 minutes on the phone. Uh, I had never met him. His children were in school with our kids. So I knew who he was. He actually, I don't know, 20 years ago was chairman of our county school board. So I, I knew who he was, but I did not know him personally. But. I think what he initially, and, and if you invite someone to come, they initially think, well, this is going to be, I, I just don't want to get into an argument. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to get into the fray. But when I convinced him that what we wanted was for he and the other two speakers, I told who the other two speakers were, and he knew them. I said, what we want is for you all to talk to us. And tell us your story. Tell us your story. Tell us your perspective. Help us see what we can do from your eyes. And we are not going to respond that night. Okay. No one's going to question, you know, we are not, no one's going to challenge anything. We are going to be a listening group. And toward the end, he said, you know, um, when I, I had called and left a message for him to call me back, and that's when he called me. He said, I wasn't going to do this thing. He said, but after we talked, see, he said, you've talked me into it. I want to be there. Hmm. But initially, he was not going to come and be part like a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, no. He wasn't going to put himself in that. I, yeah. I mean, three blacks in, in a white congregation and the, and. The, look at the look at the balance they, of power been, there. Oh, man. No way time. was he going to come to that. And when mm -hmm. I assured him, we are not doing any response at night. We want you to come and talk to us. Help us see what is needed in this community and what we can do as part of the body of Christ. And all these three were all, well, the one was a black minister who I've known for years, uh, but this gentleman was a deacon in his church, I found out later. And so they all were professing believers in Christ so they could speak from the spiritual end as well as just what like in community. Mm -hmm. But that would be my, because I think when a pastor would say to me, I mean, is this something we really should do? 
we've got to hear it from the other side. Mm-hmm. If you don't hear it from the other side, the majority of us are not going to see it. Now, depending on what your experience has been, like if you've worked, you know, you've been cross-cultural thing, maybe. But if you just lived in an area and grown up where they keep to themselves, most cities, you know, you got the Hispanic section, you got Latino, you know, people mm-hmm. kind of, we get along, but we stay in our, but when you hear them tell their story, Mm-hmm. Yeah, that opens your eyes. Well, and they said to us that night what the businessman said. He said, "You know, you all need to have some black friends. If you don't have black friends, you should have them, and you need to get some, and you need to learn from them." You know, that's mm-hmm. so true. Yeah. I mean, that that's where it has to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's. I don't know if you're familiar with Carlos Whitaker. Mm-mm. He's a musician. Um, he he's done quite a bit of. YouTube videos, Instagram videos uh-huh. on, on this. And he, he talks about, um, don't stand on issues, walk with people. So like, yeah, don't stand on racism, yeah. right. but walk with people. Cause there's going to be many yeah. different perspectives, yeah. even within the, right. the black community. Right. Yeah. 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 So what I hear from you is at least have a listening session and, and, be aware that it might be hard to get some people to come and talk because of mm-hmm. their past experiences and, mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah, that's good. What would you say to pastors who are listening saying, okay, I, I agree. I know this is something we need to address as a church, but how do we start? Where, what, how do we start educating ourselves even after, so we've had this listening session. Now, now, where do we go from? Do we just dialogue, or what do we? What do well, we? Well, somehow you've got to move it from the ideology to to practicality, and and that was when I shared a while ago some of the, the just intentional things of our congregation. I encourage people to start doing. I I, I think we have to move to that. And part of what's going to come out of that with a congregation is, is people are going to have their stories to tell. And we have to be prepared that it doesn't always work. Black people have been burned, so to speak, in efforts, in relationships. White people have, too. Mm-hmm. So some people are going to share, well, yeah, that sounds good, but I tried that and this is the way I got treated. So I'm done. You know, we have to be, we have to be prepared that there's going to be some of that. But my challenge, my response to that was, where do we find in scripture that our ministry as followers of Christ is always going to be well received? I mean, it's not, I mean, look at Jesus interaction with people. I mean, there were those who, scoffed at him who mocked him who accused him who and he continued to go on loving people but we have to be prepared uh, you know a pastor leader has to be prepared for some of that it's not like you come up with this great idea that no one else has tried and now you know i'm going to introduce to my congregation they're all going to be like first graders on a field trip and everybody's going to want to volunteer and raise their hand and everybody's going to jump into this it's not going to be that way yeah. and Again, it's not because a leader is going to say this we will do, but rather challenging people, our, our, our constituents with what does the cause of Christ call us to do? Mm-hmm. And we're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to mess up sometimes. We're going to make some real blunders, but that's no excuse to do nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think when we can start, can get on board together, even if it's not the whole congregation, some of these things have to be caught more than taught. And I think as leaders, we have to teach, but we can't just teach. We've got to lead by example. We've got to allow, even if it's a, a small group in the congregation that can get on board, be okay with that 
and and let let it be something that catches. It's contagious, can catch and be a good thing rather than like the virus. You know, mm-hmm. it can be a good thing that can start happening uh, because we know you don't lead people by driving them. Mm-hmm. And so I would caution leaders to think that, OK, I've bought into this. And so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make my congregation. No, you're not. You're not. Mm-hmm. It's not your congregation after all. You're an under mm-hmm. shepherd. Jesus Christ, it's his church. Get on your face before the Lord and ask him how you can lead his sheep mm-hmm. to grow in this area. Mm-hmm. But it's not without risk. I mean, yeah. it's. <laughs> But then mm. what is <laughs> this valuable, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. What, um, oh, it seems like there was a question I was going to ask you in what you said there, but I'll move on to the next one. That is you, you started at the very beginning talking about the importance of st- starting from a foundation of th- biblical theology scriptural theology rather than just going by people's experiences and i forget i think i think we talked about it a little bit but most of this has been about experiences and um listening where where do we start how how do for for people who have not had a theology of I mean, really what we're dealing with is uh, partiality and Mm -hmm. self-centeredness. And that happens between me and my wife, let alone outside our family, outside Mm -hmm. our community. Um, Mm -hmm. But when you get cultural, ethnic differences, the things we favor and appreciate are are amplified. They're, They're so much different. And that's kind of what the world is constructed as races. Like there's different, Mm -hmm. these people from this continent, like this style of music and and stuff. So where, where would we, how do we develop a good theology of, I don't know what you call it, theology of oneness, a theology of that we're, I I think of you, you pointed out, um, I'm not sure if you what you said, but I think of Ephesians two mm-hmm. as a as a prime example. Ephesians two and three, Paul makes the distinction that in Christ mm-hmm. that dividing wall between Jew and Gentile in all peoples are made one. Um, what are some other places you think of you go to? Well, and, 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 I, and I think what we need to do is revisit, I mean, most of our Anabaptist churches would, would ac- accept that teaching. But I think we need to revisit that and seek to understand exactly what does that mean in this culture, in this, in this mm-hmm. issue, with this issue. Because... There are those who would say, and, and well, that means equal but separate. <laughs> hmm. In other words, it's about equality. And we tend to look at that because, and, and I understand how people get to that because they say, well, that's the way we handle gender. We say hmm. that, that hmm. men and women, unlike in, in the, the day and time when Jesus walked on the earth, Women were not equal to men. In the Old Testament economy, they were not equal. They couldn't even, there was a court for the women at the temple. They did not even enter where the men did. Now, based on what Ephesians is teaching us, we don't say, well, women have this access to God. Gert has this access, but she doesn't access God like I do. We say, no, 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 no. We, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Men and women, while we differ in, in, in order, but when it comes to relating to God for salvation, value God, we say equality, okay? Mm. So equality is a part, but I think 
there are many with our churches when it comes to the race issue, we, we, we have gotten maybe to the point of saying that other races, other ethnic groups, you know, we find in the book of Revelation, we're all going to be represented. So we say, okay, they're equal, but equal in value is different than unity. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think, mm-hmm. I think that's something we have to visit. Yeah. Because I think we, I think my generation has come a long way from my parents' generation. For instance, in the South, I would say that's only that I know, but in areas where that 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 we should not look down on, okay, <laughs> that they are not less than, but that is different than unity. Than unity, and I think I think we have to we have to, and it's going to require. The, the very the way we communicated for specifically to the black culture, there were specific deliberate things that whites did that communicated to them that that you are not one with us. Hmm. There's a whole history, and we won't go down and enumerate. And there still are some of those. Uh, Gertz had some of these discussions. I know she did with one of the black nurses that worked at the clinic where she worked. And she asked her, and she could give Gert specific examples in the workplace that she experienced. Now, we're just talking about, what, 10 years ago? Yeah. When did you retire? Something like that. Okay. That while they didn't violate the laws of the land as an employee, she could give Gert, even now, specific names, exam- names, names of our situations, things specific things that were done. So it's going to take specific mm-hmm. things that we're going to do to turn this around too. It's got to get yeah. beyond. Yeah. We just talk about it. it took spe- specific things got us here and specific things are going to get us out of this. Yeah. And, and it don't have to be major thing. You have to have a March or a rally. It's like I mentioned, just, Choosing to acknowledge and give precedent, give priority mm-hmm. to. Like when Gert bought that black co-worker's lunch that day, the lady had tears in her eyes, Asher. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why? I think part of it was because of all that was going on then. But here she was in a white establishment. There were other blacks there, but I'm sure there were less, there were more whites than blacks. And here this white lady in front of everybody insists on buying her lunch. It was overwhelming to her. Yeah. yeah. Now, when we can start, pra- and I'm not highlighting one thing like that, but the thing, everything I mentioned, acknowledging, mm. I mean, I try at Lowe's. I know a lot of the black workers there. I have a personal relationship with them, and I always make a point to acknowledge them, to speak to them, to give mm. a word of encouragement there. The, the one lady, she's one of the head cashiers, and she's this virus thing is just, they've had to work, but she has just been just so fearful. And some days I can tell, and I, t- her name is Tanya. And every time I see Tanya now, I would, I would do then, I would say, smile, Tanya. You know, we're going to get through this together. And now when she sees me, she says, I'm trying, Dave. I'm smiling. Under my mask, I'm smiling. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't need to do that with her. And I'm not holding myself. I'm just saying little things yeah. because it's having an effect on me. It's making me more aware mm-hmm. and conscious, but even greater than what it's doing to me. And I would not have considered myself racist. Who of us does, mm-hmm. you know, we don't, we don't take that label on very easily, mm-hmm. but I know I can tell with the black community that I relate to, I can tell the effect it's having on them. I can tell it. I can sense it. Yeah. They're more comfortable about me. They don't, they don't cower. They don't defer or quit. They, they'll enter, they'll engage with me with things that before it was like, Oh, okay. You know, I got to take care of you. This type of thing. Well, it's yeah. a big world out there and there are a lot of hurt, broken people and we can't change the whole no. world, but we can make a difference where we are. Yeah. You know, with one person. I, I told my friend when she was here that day and I said, you know, you know, I we can't change everybody, but yeah. if I can influence one person and they can influence or two people and they can each influence two people, you know, years down the road, the effect is going to be seen. We've got to start somewhere. We've got to start right where we are. 
And I think for in our families is probably one of the greatest places because hmm. our children, no matter what words we say, we've all heard as parents, you know, more is caught than taught. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we have, we have, you know, the book of Psalms talks about children being like arrows, you know, and, and we have the opportunity beyond what Gerd and I do as individuals and as a married couple. But our six kids are going all over. We got one in Oregon tonight. We got one in Colorado Springs. We got one in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, We've got two here. And we got one in Waynesboro, Virginia. Okay? And I don't know where they're all going to end up. But we have the opportunity as parents to multiply what is right. Mm-hmm. And the same thing happens within our churches. We all say the youth of the church of tomorrow. Well, I'm more concerned. I, I am so encouraged, Asher, because the young people in my church mm-hmm. are on board with this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. than if it was the other way around, mm-hmm. because they're the future mm-hmm. of our church. Yeah. So uh, what has happened with our church in the past? And there's, there's not been Big thing, but not everything in this regard is what I would have liked to have seen. And and we've experienced a little bit of pushback from my generation, some more been more passive, but they're passing off the scene. You know, I tell my kids I've rounded third, you know, (laughs) but these young people are the future of our congregation. And Mm. to me, that's what's exciting about this. Yeah. The difference that they can make if if we handle this right. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. one book that one book that I've read, Asher, it was is on the list that was suggested reading. It's it's called Be the Bridge, Pursuing God's yeah. Heart for Racial Reconciliation by Latasha Morris. I don't know if you can you, you probably can't, can't see it at all. Yeah. It's but the not author quite, is but Latasha was that well, I was going to say, I'll, I'll put a link or something. Yeah, in. Latasha yeah. Morrison. It's called Be the Bridge, Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Reconciliation. It is a powerful book. Um, it was what somebody brought it to the church and loaned it. And I said, I've got to buy my own book because I've got to go through it and take more time and underline it and do some of these practical things in the book. If yeah. For anybody who wants to do any reading, this is the book. If you if you yeah. are not a reader and you only want to read one book, read this one. Be the bridge. It's well, I have hair. Yeah. Books, yeah. So yeah. That's my recommendation, anyhow. So that's good. I was going to ask what are what are some resources or if if maybe that list that you had sent me. I right. What was what I liked about your list was it was fairly varied. Like there, there's right. Um, right. You have. Oh, I forget what did you have the color of compromise on there? Uh, yeah. We had uh, the color of compromise that I don't think so. That's Jamar. Okay, oh, but yeah, you had you had quite a few different more right. kind we of have online anti- assessments. Take take the uh, white privilege test. <laughs> That's yeah, eye opening. <laughs> I think we're going to recommend that we do that at our church sometime. We're not going to tell people what time we're going to do it. We're just going to yeah. make them fill it out that night. <laughs> That's yeah. really eye-opening. Um, yeah. But we have podcasts, sermons and videos, books, articles, movies, um, and a lot of Did the movies and, and books were yeah. down at the church that people – and people are taking them home and looking at them or reading mm. them, blogs. Yeah. And the video clips, yeah. So, you know, some people yeah. like to read, some people yeah. like to listen. So there's a little bit of everything there. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with the restorative faith group it, that started this summer? Hmm. It's a hmm. Facebook group. Uh, I've been a part of a little bit, but um, most of the people on it originated from followers of Jesus in New York City. Are you familiar okay. with that? Yes, Daniel Pollard are. and uh, Rich and right. Sandy Swartz. Right. They're, they're not there now, but um, they've been putting, we've had, I think, four Facebook live events. Okay. Uh, 
two were just kind of an overview of racism uh-huh. and then some practical things to do. Yeah. And there's been a few more specific, like the last one that was done was on adoption and abortion. Okay. Um, more specific aspects of how the church can be a part of, of fighting racism or bringing about healing, mm-hmm. wh- whatever uh-huh. language we use. Right. So that, that might be something you could add. Yeah. yeah. For, that's yeah. From we'll make a note of that. Within the Anabaptist circles. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. Yep. Uh, it has been a pleasure. I've not met you guys before. 2020 is kind of the year to meet people virtually. So. <laughs> yeah. And that's it is true. that. Yeah. 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 But, so you're welcome yeah. to share this list or, you know, maybe you don't want to share them all, but the list that I sent you, if you want to share it, you're welcome to do that. Okay. Um, you want, yeah. might want to make your own list and take some things from this, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'll either drop them in the sh- the episode okay. notes or create like okay. a little pdf or something but okay yeah, okay do something that thank you sounds thank good you for, uh-huh. you're very welcome being generous with your time and your and your ideas here. Yeah.